Good morning from Jakarta. Welcome to the 10th Area Editors Roundtable. My name is Lydia Reddy, and I'm Area's Special Advisor to the President on U.S. ASEAN Affairs and the Director of Communications. I will be your MC today. The Editors Roundtable is Area's annual event that examines some of the most important issues facing the region. We know that understanding ASEAN as an institution can be challenging. So we've brought together ASEAN experts and veteran journalists to share their insights about how to tell the stories. Our goal is to open the door to a wide range of people who are interested in strengthening ASEAN by making it more understandable to all stakeholders. The highlight of this event is the one-to-one -one discussion between the Secretary General himself, Dato Lim Jokoi, and IRIA's President, Professor Hidetoshi Nishimura. We would like to thank our esteemed co-host of the event, the Scoop Brunei, which was launched in 2017 and has become Brunei's most popular news site, known for its thoughtful and independent journalism. And the Scoop has been an active participant in our editor's roundtable since they began. One update on the agenda. Unfortunately, the Honorable Second Minister of Foreign Affairs Brunei is not able to join us today. We will be taking questions from the audience during each of the two panel sessions, but not during the conversation with the Secretary General. To ask a question, please write it in the chat box. We will try to answer as many as we can. Without further ado, it's my pleasure to invite Professor Hidetoshi Nishimura, the President of IRIA, to give his opening remarks. Professor Nishimura, the floor is yours. Honorable, I'm Bandel, founder editor of Scoop. Honorable Tato Jokoi, Secretary General of ASEAN, distinguished editors and the senior journalists, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everywhere you are. I'm very happy to speak with all of you today. And this is a very significant editor's round table because we are celebrating its 10th anniversary. It has been a decade of network and running from one another about ASEAN and the border region of East Asia. I thank all of you and your kind cooperation. I see familiar faces of editors and the senior journalists who have been with Edia all these years. I also get to see new faces, young editors from new media platforms, which are increasingly vital for dissemination of information about Asia. We are living in uncertain world with evolving crises, ranging from the COVID-19 to climate change, not to mention superpowered rivalries. In this circumstance, ASEAN has increasing important role to play to ensure that regional integration continues unabated and economic sustainability. As such, ASEAN must remain united to ensure ASEAN centrality and catch up with the digitalized world. We have been through a tumultuous year fighting against the coronavirus by to, well, first to ensure all peoples of ASEAN can be vaccinated, and second, creating the pathways to recover from economic impacts and quickly improving all our livelihoods. So far, governments, officials, and the people of East Asia have demonstrated their cooperative spirit in this time of crisis and uncertainty in helping uh, each other. I am very confident that this trend will help us to return to normalcy and bring about a speedier 
economic recovery. This year, the focus on the impacts of the pandemic on our、um, countries and peoples, and the、uh, many ways that we can speed the recovery so that we can welcome a new area of ASEAN dynamism. We have experts in these fields from ASEAN and East Asia to share with you their thoughts. I'm sure the round table today will give us the confidence that the regional economy will be able to face emerging challenges. I hope that by this time next year,、uh, we will be able to meet each other face to face, stay healthy, wear masks, adopt social distance. See you in person in Cambodia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Nishimura. I'm now delighted to introduce Ms. Anne Van Dial, the founding editor of the Scoop, to give her opening remarks. Thank you, Lydia.、Um, thank you, Professor Nishimura and the Honorable Secretary General.、Um, good morning from Brunei Darussalam. To our distinguished guests and speakers,、um, I'll keep my remarks、uh, very brief since I'm sure everyone's very keen to get the program started.、Um, thank you for joining us at this tenth area roundtable. It's our pleasure at the Scoop to be co-hosting this event with Area today.、Um, 2021 has definitely been another challenging year for the people of ASEAN as we continue to face the uncertainty brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic. And for journalists, it's definitely been a couple. It's a momentous couple of years, reporting on a very complex and never-ending story, and one that's really reinvigorated the need for journalism to separate fact from fiction in an era that's rife with disinformation. And this infodemic of rumors and disinformation has exacerbated the pandemic and put us so many lives unnecessarily at risk. But while COVID nineteen has increased uncertainty and the challenges we face, it's also brought about resilience and highlighted the need for greater regional cooperation, particularly when it comes to equitable access to vaccines and healthcare. I hope today's panels and dialogues will be、um, a valuable platform to discuss and debate ASEAN's shared issues and challenges,、um, and I look forward to a really fruitful discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ayn. We will now start. Our first panel session, titled "ASEAN COVID-19: The Road to Recovery," moderated by Kavi Chongkitavorn, Iria's <clears throat> excuse me senior communication advisor, who is also the founding father of this event. Kavi, over to you. Well, thank you、uh, very much,、uh, Lydia. Good morning, everyone.、So、it's my pleasure to、uh, moderate this、uh, session. It's very important because we are talking about. The road to recovery, and we are so fortunate to have uh, uh, what I would like to call three musketeers. They are so good with each other, and、uh, they will discuss the different aspects of、uh, the efforts、uh, of the country in the region, how each cope with the、uh, internal and external uh, uh, environment to combat the.、Uh, Covid nineteen. I will not、uh, go into details their CV, but we will flash、uh, our speaker. The first is uh, uh, Jayan Menon, and then the, you flash the、uh, speaker, please. Oh, I think that we 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 failed to flash the CV.、Uh, the second speaker will be.、Uh, Dr. Danny Najoko of Iria, and the third one will be uh, uh, Professor Kirida from、uh, TDI from from Bangkok.、Uh, without further delay,、uh, I would like to start with uh, uh, Jayan. Jayan, you have the floor. You have about、uh, seven to ten minutes. Please. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much,、uh, Kavi. Let me start by thanking.、Uh, Iria and Scoop for having me here today. It's a great pleasure to be with you.、Um, I have a presentation which I will just try and share right now. And、um, so, please let me know if you cannot see it.、Um, hopefully, everything is in order. 
Um, try and maximize this. Okay. Uh, yeah, as I said, if anything goes wrong, please alert me. Uh, but if not, I'll assume everything is in order. So uh, I want to cover a few things in the short time that I have and go through many of these things quite quickly. The first is why the link between the pandemic and the economy is now weakening. Uh, then I want to look at how we should start thinking about the pandemic slightly differently in terms of how we measure it, as well as uh, the impacts that it's having. Uh, then I want to talk about um, how Delta uh, should hasten rather than slow border openings in uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, but then uh, it has to overcome the rise in anti-globalization forces. Right. So uh, as we all know, um, the pandemic when it started was mostly in Europe and North America, but um, it is very much here and now in Asia and particularly Southeast Asia. You can see the mortality rates from the start till now has started peaking sharply recently. And this is the reality um, that we have to deal with. We were all quite happy to say goodbye to 2020, thinking that things were turning around. But unfortunately, the new variants, especially Delta, has really uh, changed things for the worse. Right, so the first point I want to make is how this link between the pandemic and the economy is weakening. I think there are three key reasons for this. The first is that unlike the original outbreak, uh, early last year, the response from governments this time around has been a lot less draconian or much more targeted. We haven't seen um, the sort of general lockdowns uh, for prolonged periods that we saw uh, first time around when we weren't too sure how to deal with this pandemic, except for Malaysia. Malaysia had a general lockdown um, for the third time uh, when this pandemic broke up because of its severity. Uh, but again, um, we didn't see the same impact because I think firms were better able to adapt to lockdown. So there was some learning by doing over time. If you look at the Google mobility data, uh, you find that um, you know in retail, for instance, in Malaysia, uh, activity fell by 50% this time. Uh, compared to 80% the first time around, right? And finally, of course, stimulus has not only continued, but increased. In fact, it's doubled in most countries over the last six months. So all of these things uh, suggest that Delta uh, will dampen, but not derail economic recovery. And you can see that here in this chart, where, um, you know, the green bars um, uh, which is the second quarter year-on-year -year numbers, are very much uh, bounce up in all countries uh, in the region. Right. So the uh, bottom that we hit in the second quarter of 2020 will not be retested. Uh, Kavi, I think uh, you need to mute because we can hear you typing or someone's typing. Right. So um, now I want to move on to how I think we need to redefine the pandemic as well as its impacts. I think the pandemic uh, measured by the number of infections and the impacts on the economy measured by the changes in GDP are both quickly losing relevance. Um, as vaccination rates in this region uh, try and catch up, uh, the number of hospitalizations rather than the number of infections should be the focus. So we should move from flattening the infection curve to expanding the hospital capacity curve, especially the ICU capacity curve. And we are beginning to see some of this. In Singapore, where I am, uh, the uh, numbers that the Ministry of Health reports starts with uh, the deaths, then ICU uh, numbers, then hospitalization numbers, and finally, infection rates. So the order has reversed. Uh, we still are not ready to stop reporting infection rates. 
Uh, when we do, I guess that's when the pandemic is officially over, but we are working our way slowly towards that. Uh, that's when pandemic becomes endemic. Um, so that's the uh, uh, infection story. So just the final point is that, uh, you know, we need to move away from infection rates because increasingly the differences in ASEAN and elsewhere has as much to do with uh, the amount and ways of testing as it, uh, and reporting as it does anything else. So, uh, you know, these, all these factors suggest that uh, we should focus on the uh, real impacts, uh, uh, deaths and hospitalizations rather than pure infections, especially as vaccinations ramp up. Uh, and so uh, on the impact side, we also need to shift from short-term fluctuations in growth rates to long-term economic scarring. Uh, here, uh, I'm talking about uh, stubborn rises in unemployment, poverty, and all kinds of inequalities, um, as well as the intangibles, which is the rise in protectionism. And I'll return to that uh, shortly. But for now, uh, to ensure that recovery is uh, uh, sustainable, we have to start thinking about opening borders. We started uh, a while ago, um, uh, but it was stalled by the new variants. Um, and we responded by, with selective travel bans, uh, but it did not work anywhere. Uh, in this region or even in Australia and New Zealand, which almost completely shut their borders. Um, so uh, this is not, a, this is not uh, a way to keep them out. They will find a way in as they have. And once they do, the value of border closures starts to fall sharply. So border closures are only useful as a health protection device while they keep the variants out. Uh, Delta, I think, should hasten rather than slow border openings since it's everywhere in the region now. Um, so with um, borders mostly closed, and you can see that in this chart, these are the restrictions on borders, um, you know, uh, excessive domestic easing has been pursued uh, because of the eco economic imperative. Right? And this is what has led to soaring infection rates, not border uh, openings. Um, and I think that's where we need to narrow or rebalance domestic versus border restrictions um, in a careful way uh, going forward. Uh, we have started now uh, in Thailand, for instance, looking at micro herd immunity, where there's been unilateral opening in Phuket and Koh Samui, and now spreading to Bali and Vietnam. Uh, this is one way to get things rolling in a unilateral way. And hopefully this will lead to uh, reciprocity, right? So this is where travel bubbles, which we tried before, uh, but failed. Hopefully they will come back. And once we get moving, then we can look at multilateralizing them uh, to include more countries, right? But uh, we have to overcome the rise in uh, anti-globalization forces that's working against these moves, right? The rise in nationalism and protectionism. Uh, and now protection comes in different <laughs> sizes. Uh, in the post-GFC period, it was called rebalancing. Uh, just before COVID, there was a lot of talk about reshoring. And now even resilience is often used as a new way to bring in protection uh, or to try and move China out of uh, global supply chains. And I think Donnie will talk a bit more about that later. So uh, while the pandemic is increasing the need for greater capital and labor mobility, it is also uh, simultaneously reducing the appetite for it, uh, which is a concern. And so I fear that what might happen is that the need will spill over into informal flows uh, if we keep formal flows, uh, you know, compressed. And we've seen this before, uh, you know,
know, there's a lot of informal or unre unrecorded labor movements in this region. And this is not good for sending or receiving countries. And I think the pandemic has highlighted uh, that fact. So if we cannot increase factor movements, then trade uh, can partly substitute for it uh, through factor price equalizations. In other words, wages and uh, rentals on capital can equalize simply through trade, even without any movement across borders in labor or capital. And so this is where our trade agreements, uh, both regional and multilateral, like AEC, RCEP, and CPTPP, but also the WTO, which has the ministerial coming up next month, must play a bigger role going forward. So uh, with that, let me quickly conclude uh, with the key points, and that is that recovery is underway, but it's mixed and uncertain. Um, as vaccination rates rise, we need to shift the focus from infection rates to hospitalization rates. So we need to redefine uh, the pandemic in this way. Uh, Delta is uh, rapidly eroding the value, but not the cost of border closures. So it's, start to, it's time to start planning to open borders uh, as vaccination rates uh, ramp up. And we can start unilaterally with these micro herd immunity uh, bubbles and move uh, quickly to bilateral or reciprocal arrangements. And then finally to multilateralize them when we harmonize uh, standards and uh, mutually recognize them. And ASEAN here uh, can play a role as can other regional organizations. Uh, but we must uh, first overcome the rise in anti-globalization forces that has found new fodder, fodder with this pandemic. Uh, and that will be a key challenge in the post-pandemic new normal. Uh, and if we can't overcome the uh, resistance to uh, factor movements, then we must at least try and keep trade moving, uh, trade in uh, goods and services and data. Uh, because they can have similar, although they're not perfect substitutes, they can have similar impacts in reducing the adjustment cost to the new normal. So with that, uh, let me stop there. Thank you for your attention and look forward to your questions. Back to you, Kavi. Wow, thank you very much, Jayan. As a journalist, I can see 12 headlines. But one of the big headlines for newspaper is one takeaway that you said the damp, uh, the Delta or whatever that uh, dilemma we are facing uh, will just dampen the economic growth, but it will not derail. And you leave a lot of rooms for interpretations. And also, I think journalists will follow up on whatever you have said in your uh, summary, very good one. Um, I'd like to proceed to our second speaker, uh, Dr. Donny from Iria. Please, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Kavi. Let me now uh, share my screen. Uh, <clears throat> all right, so <clears throat> I have uh, seven minutes or so. Uh, basically, what I want to uh, talk here, what uh, the points I want to uh, explain, uh, complement, and uh, maybe a bit uh, uh, deepen the uh, points that Jay uh, has made. So <clears throat> I'll talk a couple of points here. Uh, there are some facts, and because of these facts, then there, real, there, there are some implications uh, for the futures. Uh, the first is <clears throat> uh, the first is global value chains uh, or international production networks that involve a lot of ASEAN member states. Uh, we are talking about ASEAN here. Uh, more or less, will stay, and this is quite a robust results. Uh, and we in Hiria here uh, had uh, several papers uh, that shows this, uh, that global value chains uh, actually quickly recovered. And uh, it, it's, it was already recovered by the, the last quarter of last year. And this is consistent with one of the uh, graphs that uh, Jay showed uh, in some of GDP of uh, ASEAN member states that most of them recover already in quarter four, 2020. However, there is some 
uh, footnote here, uh, while in terms of value added, uh, mostly recovered in the last quarter, but in, in, in few countries, we are seeing uh, the pattern of employment uh, already, although they are recovered, but the recovery rate uh, for employment is, is, much, is, is slower than the recovery rate in value added which may suggest that uh, firms uh, already have started to make some adjustment in their uh, technology uh, of productions. And many people ask why global value chains uh, quickly recovered uh, in this uh, pandemic. Well, one important reason is because, uh, and we often take this for granted sometimes, uh, these networks of productions that runs across ASEAN member states uh, with the East Asian countries like Japan, Korea, and others, uh, is already very established. Uh, investment has, huge investment uh, has been made by multinationals since early 1990s or even late uh, 1980s uh, on establishing these networks. And, and therefore it's not that easy actually to break down uh, this network. So the networks is still there, uh, however, <clears throat> because the extent of the shock this time is, was extraordinary, then adjustment of course need to be made and we are start seeing this. The point in regard to this adjustment, uh, basically there is a lot of pressure for efficiency for the companies, for the multinational, the subcontractors, because at least two reasons. First, it's, now we are seeing a much more limited movement of, of people across countries. In terms of global value chains, this really limit the movement of uh, professionals of, for example, engineers, technicians, uh, supervisors of uh, uh, factories. And, and we in India uh, noted that this happened quite a lot uh, in mid uh, last years when uh, new investment in some of the CLMV countries cannot be uh, really you know, materialized because of this movement, limited movement of people. And because there is limited movement of people and because there's a lot of uh, goods uh, or inputs are carried by uh, airplanes, uh, there's also, there, there is, a, you know, much uh, lower uh, traffics uh, of in air transport as well as in sea transport. There is, also, for example, the lack of uh, supply of containers in many countries uh, and, and so on and so forth. So the, the implication is the logistics uh, costs faced by firms increase and to some of them, what I heard, it could be significant like three to five times uh, compared to the before pandemic. So companies have to cope with this. Uh, the global value chains, the, the uh, companies needs to be uh, really made adjustment for this. And the, the adjustment or the direction of the adjustment uh, can be in these three following uh, uh, area. First is, of course, adopting more uh, digital technology. I guess even before the pandemic, uh, companies around the world have started to adopt more uh, digitalized uh, technology, but the pandemic has just accelerated uh, this uh, uh, adoption or adoption of the uh, digital. And this actually not, does not happen only in private sectors. This needs to happen also in public sectors. And if we, if we are talking about the uh, global uh, value chains, uh, countries need to make a lot of investment uh, to upgrade their, <coughs> uh, their digitalizations, for example, for, for trade facilitations like in facilities in seaports, airports, uh, for <clears throat> customs, uh, for all of the uh, elements of trade facilitation, for national single windows, for example. Uh, so a lot of elements of trade facilitation needs to be uh, much more digitalized. <clears throat> uh, second, of course, is streamlining, streamlining this, the supply process uh, across and within the value chains. And, and I guess uh, much part of this is, uh, has something to do with uh, technology up, upgrading. 
and and I guess a uh, few or several surveys done by uh, many institutions, including us, have shown this that uh, CEOs uh, uh, all CEOs <coughs> uh, have an option to uh, uh, actually invest upgrading their technology during the pandemic uh, period. And because companies are upgrading more in high tech, uh, of course, the, another implication is there, need, there is a need to upgrade the human capital uh, to transform uh, the, the skill because there will be a lot more high technology uh, uh, productions uh, machineries installed in manufacturers. Now, that's kind of one uh, line of story. The second is I want to touch the point about uh, RCEPs, uh, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. Jay mentioned that this uh, should facilitate uh, the recovery, <clears throat> the path of recovery post-pandemic. And from, from uh, my point of view, or some, uh, some of us actually, uh, the, 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 at the end, it will... Uh, uh, implementation of RCP will be needed even more uh, in order to uh, facilitate the recovery during the post-pandemic. Now, RCP itself is a, what's so called pre-pandemic uh, FTA. Uh, it was uh, designed, negotiated, and signed before the, the pandemic. But because the RCP is intended uh, to making trade between countries in East Asia and Southeast Asia a lot cheaper, and this is to facilitate a deeper and expanded global value chains. For example, we can see that uh, you know one of these uh, feature of RCEP is uh, a lot more uh, relaxed rule of origin for trade in intermediate inputs. For example, that's really making trade between countries a lot cheaper, and that means uh, supporting for higher growth in global value chains. So at the end, uh, <clears throat> what is intended uh, to be achieved by RCEP is in accordance to what is needed by, by the economy or private sectors in general during the post pandemic because of there is this pressure for uh, efficiency. So the implication is, as I noted, uh, the, focus to, the focus on reforms uh, that needed to, to implement RCEP uh, is becoming much more needed this time. I guess I will stop there, Kavi, uh, back to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. You have uh, discussed uh, in a very good details of the adjustments that uh, all the countries in the region have to make both internally and externally. Luckily, as you mentioned, the global value chains in the region recover uh, pretty fast. And I think this will explain uh, a speedier uh, recovery uh, within the region facilitated by uh, our super free trade pact, which need further reform. Thank you so much for uh, bringing out these uh, resilient points. Now, our last speaker is our rather well-known economist from Thailand, Dr. Grida. You have the floor, please. Thank you so much, Kun Gowi, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you, wherever you are. I'm based in Bangkok, and um, it's such a pleasure to be here today to be able to share with you um, how we see, you know, the um, the post-pandemic um, recovery um, happening. And then, as uh, I was discussing with Kun Gowi, that Jay and Donnie has, you know, um, you know, lots of interesting points and very relevant information to share already. So, what I would probably um, contribute today is how we see some mega trends going forward that will affect ASEAN and also probably some of the opportunities for ASEAN in order to grow you know, into the future in the post-pandemic world. So you know, I would like to um, you know, take about seven to ten minutes to, um, to highlight these uh, you know, issues so that journalists in the region can keep an eye out for them um, in the future. And I, I would like to say that I would like to um, divide the trends that I see into two parts. Um, first part is um, 
trends that uh, have to do with the macroeconomics. Um, and that will definitely affect ASEAN economies as well. And then I will go to the second set of trends that are not you know, econo um, economic, macroeconomic, but it does affect ASEAN economies. And then um, towards the end, I will point out some of the um, business opportunities that um, ASEAN countries um, you know, could, uh, could take advantage of in this post-pandemic world. So let me start you know, by, by talking about um, the, the mega trends that, that um, we see, um, starting with the macroeconomic trends. And uh, one of the things that we have to keep in mind that growth um, is, is happening now, um, the world is recovering, but recovery is divergent. Right. I mean, the developed countries are growing much faster um, in um, this uh, post pandemic um, period, while the developing countries are growing, um, but it's still much slower because it's still grappling with the pandemic issues um, as we speak. So, you know, and we're in Asia now in, in the second group, which is the developing country group. So we're, we're, we'll recover, but it will be slower. The faster pace of um, recovery in the developed countries, especially in the US, does have implications for our economy. Um, namely that, first of all, you know, interest rates um, in, the, in, in the US will rise probably by the end of next year. So that will you know, push interest rates in the world up as well. And as we know, many countries in ASEAN um, have incurred debt, uh, especially public debt during um, the pandemic period um, to fight the, you know, the pandemic. Many governments have borrowed. So so, you know, as interest rates, you know, um, are looking to rise in the future, this will be a challenge that we have to look out for, especially for the public um, sector uh, uh, debt uh, that, you know, uh, developing countries um, have, have incurred. I mean, the, the IIF um, latest data states that the, the you know, debt in um, the world is around 300 trillion US dollars at the moment. Um, and, you know, a third of them are in developing or in, in the emerging markets. So it, it, it's a huge number that we have to look out for. But it's not only interest rates, right, that will be rising. Um, the U.S. dollar is also strengthening. And that's because when the U.S. economy recovers, the U.S. has, you know, reduced um, its, um, its quantitative easing. So, you know, by reducing quantitative easing, it's pumping out less um, U.S. dollars per month. And, you know, the, the forecast is that probably by the end of next year, they will stop, you know, pumping additional U.S. dollars. So, with the decline in, in the you know, in, in the additional supply of U.S. dollars, the U.S. dollar has been strengthening. And again, this is why our regional currencies has been weakening. And if you know if you're in debt, and especially in um, countries which have incurred uh, foreign currency debt, the rising interest rates, the strengthening U.S. dollars will definitely uh, affect them. So, so this is something that you know uh, one has to look out for. Um, you know, in in terms of the of the post pandemic sort of like macroeconomic uh, impact that um, ASEAN countries will, will need to face. Um, so, you know, that, those are the things that I think on the macroeconomic front that we need to look out for. For the non-macroeconomic um, trends that I um, see that will, will be important for ASEAN, um, definitely the U.S., um, China, trade, and um, tech wars will definitely play a big role here, um, especially, you know, for ASEAN countries that are supply chains or global value chains, you know, of, of the U.S. and of China, because that will be changing as well as the U.S. and China, you know, wage, continue to wage the trade war, which is probably not going to end anytime soon. So, so that, you know, will definitely affect the supply chains. And we're already seeing relocations of firms from China to uh, Southeast Asia. And these are not only Chinese firms, these are um, American firms, Japanese firms, South Korean firms, Taiwanese firms. They are relocating so, or, you know, ch changing their, their, their supply chains. Um, and many of them have relocated to Southeast Asia to reduce the risk of, of you know, being uh, in China. So they were uh, diversifying. So most of the capacity that's being moved to um, Southeast Asia, for example, are um, production that, you know, used to be produced in China for exports. Those are moved to Southeast Asia. But the production that is produced and consumed or sold in China, that's still kept in China. And we're seeing a, a lot of, um, you know, relocations, for example, in Thailand, where I am now, you know, we're seeing a, a lot of car manufacturers, car part manufacturers, um, um, electronics um, manufacturers, um, electrical appliance manufacturers um, that are moving from China to, to Thailand. But for example, Vietnam, which is the largest recipient of the relocations, are receiving, you know, investments um, all, you know, 
from a whole spectrum from like footwear to um to tablets. So it's it's a it's a wide spectrum of uh, you know of investments there in Vietnam. So so we're seeing this as part of the the, the um response to the to the US China trade war. But also um don't forget there's also a technology war that is waging uh, um, between the two countries and that has already you know affected some of us in the region especially um if we need um advanced semiconductors or chips for production. For example, in Thailand, we use those for cars, um, manufacturing or production in Thailand. And the shortage of chips, um, you know, have been a big problem here because, um, you know, we have to uh, shut down um, our car production from time to time because of the shortage of chips. And these chips are being used in you know, tablets and phones. Um, and, and this is, you know, in, in short supply at the moment. One of the reasons is because um, of the high demand, but the other is also because the supply is now being limited when the U.S. has um, now, you know, um, issued you know, sort of like a, a, a regulation or, or uh um, measures that do not allow uh, companies that use U.S. technology to supply parts um, of semiconductors to China. So Chinese semiconductors companies cannot produce semiconductors at the moment. So that's already affecting us. And in the future, of course, they, you know, um, will be, you know, um, more of these impacts um, coming um, in the future. For example, in the area of telecommunications, for example, 5G, 6G, the world will be split into two camps of technology, and, and as as a user of technology in ASEAN, who do we, who do we um, choose to use? Which technology? Or if we need to use both, that will be quite expensive for us. So this is also something that you know um, uh, will will be important to to keep an eye on. And you know other trends that that um, that we see um, other than the um, the the trade and the tech war between the two um, uh, giants. Uh, for example, um, of course, you know, digitalization, you know, as, as um, Adani also mentioned, that will not go away anytime soon. Um, digitalization, um, you know, uh, we can see a lot from e-commerce, for example, here in Thailand over the past one year, e-commerce um, grew by 200%, uh, of course, from a low base, but, you know, this is a, a very fast pace and it's going to continue. It's going to continue in the future because people are used to it, but it's not only e-commerce, right? I mean, it's, it's anything that's from home, um, entertainment or even telemedicine, which is going to be the, fi the future of, of you know, um, healthcare here in, in the region as well. So that's something that you know, one should keep an eye on. And of course, you know, when we talk about digitalization, we also talk about the, the supply chains um, of them. So anything to do with um, you know, digital uh, technology providers, software, so even cybersecurity uh, providers. I mean, you know, these are um, uh, businesses that are, are really doing Doing well at this time. Um, not to mention even the you know the delivery service from the e-commerce. So so these are things that you know will will, will help growth um, in in um, Southeast Asia going forward. Uh, and and this will probably you know reduce costs for uh, many of the small and medium enterprises um, in, uh, in in Southeast Asia as well. So that's something that that we see you know that will will continue as well. Um, the two other things that I want to mention actually three uh, is uh, uh, for climate change, you know, that's going to be here and we will definitely, you know, have to have to uh, cope with it. But uh, but with climate change, um, that has to do a lot because we you know, rely a lot on agriculture. So that, you know, has a, a lot to do, um, you know, with um, the economies of Southeast Asia as well. So that's something to to, to still, you know, pretty much keep an eye on. Um, but also with, with climate change comes now a push for decarbonization, all right, especially in um, in the West where in the next two years, for example, the European Union has announced that they will start their border tax on, um, on goods that, you know, that, that import with um, high carbon content. So that's something that um, you know, ASEAN countries have to ad adapt as well, because we are you know, exporters of goods to um, the European Union. It's, uh, it's, it's one of our big markets. So, so here again, you know, I think decarbonization um, is, you know, we can view it at, at one point as, you know, as a challenge, because um, many of the Southeast Asian countries haven't really prepared ourselves to um, decarbonize, uh, um, but, and, and it will have impact on us because we'll have difficulties exporting to Europe in the future. But all at the same time, I think it's also an opportunity for many industries or businesses um, that are green, you know, that um, adopt, you know, the circular economy or adopt um, you know, the bioeconomy, you know, that will be opportunities. And especially I want to mention that in this region, um, you know, we, we have a good chance of being um, the, you know, the supply chain for bioproducts, for example, because we're rich in the raw materials of 
agriculture and bioproducts here i mean anything to do um you know add value to agriculture um you know from cosmetics you know, to medicine, right, to um, degradable plastic, so even to plant-based uh, proteins. So, you know, I think this is something that, you know, we, we have um, some um, comparative advantage uh, in the region uh, because of the abundant raw materials, and we need to add value um, to take advantage of the, of the bioeconomy, which is also green and also low carbon as well. So that's something that I think, you know, is a challenge, but also um, it is an opportunity. Um, the last thing I would like to mention um, is the aging society. And that's something that is, um, you know, inevitable. Uh, we know, you know, Singapore um, has aged, um, Japan has aged, China has aged, Thailand has aged. Um, many other countries in the region will be aging. So that's something that is to look out for because um, aging does not only um, affects, you know, the, the government um, spending on welfare for them, but also, you know, the labor force is falling. Um, you know, can we build synergy? between countries that are aging and countries that still have a big young population. So that's something that, you know, that's very, you know, that's very challenging. But at the same time, it presents a lot of opportunities as well, because the market for, you know, for aging population is now much bigger. And, you know, to be honest, when I look at the global map on aging, it's usually the, the, the more wealthy countries who are aging first. So there's a lot of opportunities for us to produce um, products or services um, to, um, to cater to the, to the aging population, um, especially, you know, in, in our export market. So um, I know I've ran out of time and I think I've pretty much covered, you know, both the, um, the trends and the risk and the opportunities that us in countries can look forward to in the post um, COVID. COVID world. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Grida. You have given us a lot uh, uh, to shield on, especially the global trend. I think my two takeaway for journalists is the rivalry between US and China trade conflict that will impact on the technological uh, development within the region. You. Uh, has been pretty bold in saying that, you know, maybe we have to choose sides between the American or the US led technology, we will see, very interesting. And I think uh, we have to get ready in the futures because of the climate change, the so-called decarbonization. I think country in our region still um, have not put that in their agenda. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, uh, we, we will have a very good, uh, uh, questions and answer sessions. Uh, we already have questions uh, come in. Lydia, can you help me? I have seen the chat box uh, uh, questions uh, for everyone, right? Can you yeah, read that so, aloud, please? So the first question that came in was from ba Iman Bambagil, who's asking essentially, uh, how do we maximize the potential of, the, of digitalization? And um, especially in the context of a, advantage, the borderless world. So I'm not sure who would like to address that. Uh, why don't, uh, I, I think, uh, uh, Jayan, please, can you take up the first one first? Oh, okay. I thought you were going to go to the others first, right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think, uh, you know, as, as um, both Johnny and uh, Kirida have mentioned, the digital uh, uh, you know, uh, economy has been accelerated uh, by the pandemic. Uh, it was already starting, but it's gone a lot further. I guess this event today is a good example of that itself. Um, I think there's uh, a number of issues. I think uh, it will cause a lot of disruption to uh, labor markets. Uh, and that's um, on the negative side. There are lots of positives that you can have. Uh, including on increasing inclusion um, and supporting SMEs to engage in international e-commerce and so on. But uh, on the adjustment side, uh, there'll be a lot of uh, labor market churning, as it's called, uh, especially uh, in the lower end of the skills spectrum. And this is where, you know, we will need a lot more uh, uh, labor mobility, both within countries as well as across borders. And my concern is that the, uh, the barriers that have been erected uh, in the name of uh, health and the pandemic to labor movements will remain in place a lot longer than they're required. 
uh, once we move into a post-pandemic new normal. Uh, you know, the new normal is going to involve high levels of unemployment at home, and, uh, you know, there'll be resistance to open up borders to labor inflows. Um, and this might spill over into informal or unrecorded labor inflows. So I think the digital economy has a lot of positives it can provide, but we also need to understand there'll be a lot of adjustment costs and we need to keep or return uh, you know, to uh, open uh, borders, uh, to keep labor mobility going uh, when it's required uh, in a post-pandemic new normal. Let me stop there and leave it to others to say more. May I add something to, to this as well? Yes, um, please. I, I, I think um, as, as Jay rightly mentioned that, you know, this will be disruptive. And I can think of two other sectors that will be disrupted. I mean, there are many good things that come up from the digital economy. But as Jay mentioned, there are also disruptions that come about. Two of them that I can see is one is in the, the financial sector. Definitely, there will be benefits for, you know, for uh, more lending to, um, you know, to grab grassroots, um, you know, communities of people, but of course, banks will be um, disrupted. Uh, and of course, if banks are, you know, the major players in any um, uh, Southeast Asian countries, I mean, their profits would drop and, you know, that might have an, an, an impact on, on the um, economy as well. So that's something to look out for as well is the financial disruption. The other thing that I see is in the property sector, you know, as more and more um, people, um, you know, work from home, there will be less, you know, um, demand, you know, for office spaces. And, and in, in Bangkok here, I see a lot of vacant um, office spaces, and that could also be quite disruptive to the, um, to the property sector. And especially to those that lend money to the property sector, that's banks. So again, you know, this has um, implications for, for these sectors to adapt. And if they can't, I mean, they can't, they, there might be some, um, you know, um, economic impact in, in the short run um, to, to the economies. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Donnie, do you have anything to yeah. add to that? Yeah, if I may, Kavi. Selamat pagi, Pak Iman. Thank you. Apa kabar? And well, you are the man for RCP. Of course, but uh, answering your questions, try to answer the questions. Uh, there are a few points, but in my view, <clears throat> first, uh, digital and uh, economic integrations or uh, a country's economy is, is, seems like it's a test to our institutions, both at the country level and at multi-regional, uh, multilateral level. So uh, it's a test because digitalizations and private sectors typically has moved forward a lot faster than the public sector, the government sector. Uh, for example, uh, I had one research uh, in the last years and I noticed uh, there are a few creative ways to do trade uh, fair and using uh, the virtual reality technology. Uh, I guess Korea uh, has uh, experimented this uh, at much earlier time last year as well. Actually, Indonesia, as far as I know, also uh, applied this because of the movement, uh, uh, limitation in the movement of people. So trade fair is done virtually and using virtual reality. That's, that's very, 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 uh, very good. But then when there is or there are new trade deals, export deals coming out from this new way of trade fair, sometimes new exporters do not know how to export. And, and therefore, uh, to facilitate that, there is a need uh, from our institutions, both at the country level or at multilateral level, uh, such as ASEAN, uh, need to be you know, need to be, uh, I mean, the reform uh, under this, this uh, country level need, or ASEAN level need to be uh, speed up. And if we are talking about ASEAN level, the way I see it actually is ASEAN economic community uh, can be used as a platform to, to further speed up this reform. Uh, and... and uh, <clears throat> Yeah, and it can be used as a platform to, to, to digitalize more. And by the way, uh, one reason why between countries transaction because of digitalization pretty much is still limited 
because all of these institutional factors, the way I see it. And there is the reasons why, as Krida mentions, the growth of digital related economy activities is extremely rapid within the country at the domestic level. Because basically there is no borders. SME can just anytime on board to platforms, e-commerce platform and sell without any institutional barrier. Uh, so, so the digitalization really flourished within country at this moment because there is no barrier, institutional barrier. Now, back to the, the point uh, on the AEC can be used as a platform. I guess what comes next, if we want to be effective, and this is really the question from the other uh, participants, is to focus and to strategize, and I guess to maybe to focus on details. Uh, for example, <clears throat> and and. On this, uh, we or ASEAN in general can utilize, or in any, any countries or any groupings can utilize research. Uh, and the strategy could be focusing on some details of the aspect of uh, trade reform or investment reform. For example, on services, uh, reforms could be focused or prioritized in sectors that are really important for global value chain, such as logistics, business services, uh, or even uh, uh, digital services. Uh, for micro and small enterprises, for example, reform can be focused. Uh, this is, for example, if you are talking about the SME group of ASEAN, AXMI, uh, reform can be focused on capacity building because uh, for SMEs to, to get into, a, to get onto platforms, there is some skill, uh, there is some sort of need of uh, specific skill, digital skills that still need, need to be nurtured for many of the micro and small enterprises. So I guess the, the, the key word is focus and strategize and go into details. Yeah, maybe there's something that I can add. Uh, Pak Gavi, thank you. Oh, well, thank, thank you, you very much. Uh, that explains why uh, Donny from Indonesia can uh, uh, exemplify Indonesia uh, using digitalization SME, you know, you have so many unicorn now. <laughs> okay, we have times for, for one more question. Lydia, you have uh, extra questions? Um, let's see. Sorry. I saw one. There are several. So there was one uh, follow-up for Donnie on RCEP, and then there was another one for Giant on Will COVID variants upset the benefits? Will will any new possible COVID variants upset the benefits of opening borders? So just very quickly, because actually this panel is out of time. We need to move to the next. Okay, panel. okay. But, but before we uh, we answer this, I, I would like to uh, request uh, the panelists to give their answer and also wrap up what they want to say. One minute each, please, because the time is up. Thank you. Can we start with uh, uh, Dr. Girida, please? Thank you. Thank you very much. Actually, I just want to say that, um, you know, there will be uh, many um, uncertainties that we're still uh, looking forward to, um, especially on, you know, the variant of the, of the virus. Um, and again, you know, we have to look out for, you know, a few things um, regarding the U.S.-China relations, as well as uh, the um, issues on the climate change and environment as well. So um, it's going to be a bumpy ride going forward, though we can see recovery in the horizon. So again, you know, um, um, it will be quite interesting um, to, to keep an eye out for all these uh, important issues that all of our three panelists have highlighted today. I think that will be all I would like to say because we're running out of time now. Thank you so okay. much. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it's a good message. Uh, Dr. Jayan, your turn. Right. Uh, thank you. So uh, let me try and answer the question, I guess, that was posed about whether we need to be concerned uh, about new variants uh, and so uh, whether we should still keep borders closed. Well, if border closures could keep out new variants, then we should. But um, all the evidence has suggested that uh, it cannot. And the reason for that is because by the time the genetic sequencing alone doesn't tell us whether it's a much more transmissible variant. It has to show up in large case numbers. And by, by the time that it shows up in large case numbers, it's too late. The horse has bolted, so to speak. So uh, I would support border closures if they could work, but they can't. 
And so, um, you know, I think um, uh, the other point is that, um, uh, you know, we've actually exacerbated the problem because we've relied only on domestic easing to support the economy in the economy uh, health trade-off. And in fact, that's been counterproductive. If we could balance it a bit more with the border and domestic uh, restrictions, I think we could get the same economic impact with less health, uh, negative health consequences. And uh, that's where I think we should go forward in a recalibration that evens up the balance of domestic and border restrictions to serve both our economic and health objectives. Let me stop there. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jang. How about Donnie, you have 50 seconds. Okay, just, just, want, to, yeah, just want to maybe uh, wrap up and answering the, the questions on RCP. Uh, effective action or strategies, uh, I guess, uh, if, if we are thinking RCP is meant for strengthening global value chains in ASEAN and East Asia, that means what we can do is to focus on elements of global value chains uh, under RCEP. So for example, if you're talking about services uh, reform or liberalization under RCEP, then we can focus on you know, sectors like business services, logistics, or even digital. And if we are talking about uh, uh, yeah, uh, rule of origins or NTMs, NTMs, for example, we can focus on uh, NTMs for the groups of intermediate inputs or services. Uh, services is for under services. Now, uh, you're also asking about the uh, stakeholders. I guess uh, the, the usual stakeholders, of course, but much more importantly, I guess private sectors uh, needs to be really uh, considered uh, in the process of uh, monitoring and evaluation of RCEP because uh, they are the, you know, the, the most important client of this RCEP. Uh, agreement. Yeah, maybe I'll stop there. Uh, thank you, Kavi. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you very much. Uh, after listening to all of you, my bottom line is the pandemic has created tons of crisis and also opportunity for innovations and also bringing together uh, to, uh, people, policy planners, or stakeholders. And we look forward to a better <laughs> post-pandemic world. I would like to thank all the panelists for their very rich analysis. And also I think journalists uh, will have a lot to report on. Thank you so much for your uh, um, Thank excellent you. Thank you, Gavi. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. The panelists. Yeah. Thank you, yeah, thank everyone. You. Thank you, thank everyone. you Kavi, and thank you to all of you for an excellent panel. Uh, there were a couple of questions that didn't get answered, but we may be able to get back to them uh, in the second round. So with that, I'd like to invite Gwen Robinson, editor-at-large for Nikkei Asia Review, who will moderate this panel session too, called, Are We Ready for the New Dynamics? So Gwen, over to you. Thank you, Lydia, and um, good morning, everybody, distinguished guests and uh, viewers. Um, as you've heard, uh, I think the previous panel set out uh, uh, very starkly and interestingly, a lot of the challenges this region is facing. And in our next session, we're going to tackle the question of, is the region ready to meet the challenges of these new dynamics that uh, we've just heard about? And uh, I would first like to introduce, you've got details of um, our excellent panel, but uh, just to run through very quickly, Dr. Aladdin D. Rio, Senior Economic Advisor at AREA. Um, uh, Mr. Yasu Ota, columnist at Nikkei Inc. And finally, Ms. Ima Abdul Rahim, Director of Public Policy Southeast Asia for Facebook. So this is our um, wonderful panel who are going to give us their views on uh, the issues that we're, we're looking at here. So regarding our question today, whether the region is ready for the new dynamics. It's both a very hard and easy question. It's hard because there is no single answer and it's easy because you could approach this question in any way and talk in general generalities. But when we're focusing on this region, particularly Southeast Asia, we're dealing with a huge range of factors, 
And I think the starkest point is the overall growth figure for East Asia and the Pacific, which the World Bank has just put out um, in its uh, uh, twice yearly uh, economic update report. And we had a, a figure of about 7% plus for the year ahead growth in East Asia and the Pacific. But if you strip out China, which itself is forecast to grow by 8.5%, we're looking at barely 2.5% for the region ex-China amid what we've heard about this morning, falling labor force participation, employment rates, um, you know, value chain slowdowns, et cetera. And as the World Bank highlighted, these figures mask vast and growing inequalities. Thailand, for example, has just revised down its meager growth forecast to just 0.7%. Uh, Myanmar, meanwhile, is deep in negative territory at more than 18% contraction. So these are some of the factors in the region. So it's impossible, I think, to give an overall view. Uh, even so, we've got cause for optimism, as, as our panelists earlier pointed out. So I'd like to kick off this session by asking each of the speakers to address the overall question of gauging the region's ability to meet these new challenges, but also to take into account the vast disparities and highlight perhaps the greatest strengths and weaknesses across this re region in meeting the challenges. So I think um, first up, we'll turn to you, Aladdin, um, uh, and uh, you can set out how you see it. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Gwen, and uh, good morning to all colleagues. Uh, uh, I hope you can hear me well. I think that's a very interesting question, Gwen, whether the region is indeed ready for these new dynamics. Because when you look at these new dynamics in the region, as highlighted by the pandemic, uh, I think we're talking here of issues related to digitalization, a green economy, climate change, or sustainability in, in general. Looking at these issues or these new dynamics, I think for me, these are not actually new for ASEAN. Uh, I think these are issues that have been discussed before in the region. I think even before the pandemic, uh, ASEAN has been addressing all, this, all these sorts of issues. And this is very much evident through various uh, regional mechanisms and initiatives. So in a way, I think, uh, ASEAN has already recognized the importance of all these issues. And the way I see it and the fact that some of these issues have already been uh, incorporated into the regional agenda of ASEAN, uh, for me indicates that the region is indeed ready to deal with these issues and challenges. What happened was that during this pandemic, uh, I think COVID-19 uh, highlighted more the need to better understand these issues, particularly for the region. And also in my view, it has uh, accelerated the, the need to come up with more regional action to address these issues. In my view, however, the more pertinent question here is to what extent that readiness by ASEAN has been translated into more meaningful and concrete uh, outcomes on the ground. What I'm saying here is that we're talking about digitalization, sustainability. ASEAN has done something in this area, but the question is, is that enough? Have we done enough in the region to address these issues of digital transformation and sustainability, for example? Or is there anything else that we need to do? Or are there things that we're missing out? I think I'll try to put my thoughts along these uh, mm. uh, questions, uh, Gwen. So I think let me start with the question of, uh, or the issue of digitalization. I know this was already discussed uh, earlier in the previous panel, but I would like to provide my perspectives on this issue because this is an important uh, 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 issue right now during this pandemic that would also eventually uh, uh, shape the future of the post-pandemic recovery in ASEAN. If you look at what's happening in ASEAN, I think over the last three years or so, uh, digital uh, development has become an important priority for the region. And this is very much evident in the number of regional plans and statements that have been issued. Some of these are referring to, for example, digital integration, e-commerce, or data governance, among other priorities. 
And all of them also comprise uh, both, uh, in my sense, common and uh, comprehensive agenda, and also some strategies or call for action for the region. Also, uh, if you are following ASEAN, I think this year, early this year, uh, the ASEAN Digital Master Plan 2025 was uh, issued in the region to provide uh, an overall arching, uh, an overarching uh, perspective or framework on how the region can facilitate the digital uh, economy or support the digital economy. And last month, the economic ministers also issued uh, some new initiatives, uh, including, for example, uh, the Bandar uh, Seribigawan Roadmap for Digital Transformation, and also the proposed establishment of the Digital Economy Framework Agreement by 2023. So looking at all these initiatives in my view, I think all these initiatives for me indicate that ASEAN is indeed ready to embrace digitalization. But for me, one important concern or problem here is to what extent these initiatives are going to be implemented. I know that since I think 2018, a number of initiatives have been put out in the region, but I think the question now is whether the implementation is, is being able to measure up you know, in terms of what's going on uh, in, in the region or, or the realities in the region. For me, one important or one glaring issue at the moment in the region is the widening digital divide. This is an issue that has been discussed for so long, but the problem is that it continues to persist in ASEAN. And if you look at the numbers, the numbers are indeed telling. I mean, for example, some evidence suggests that the size of the digital economy in ASEAN is still very small. It only accounts for 7% of the total regional economy. And also 50% of the ASEAN digital economy are mostly concentrated on the urban areas. So that basically shows us already the digital divide. And I think the digital divide is also evident in terms of the, uh, the gender dimension of it. Again, some evidence suggests that there are fewer uh, uh, women than men who have smartphones and have access to mobile internet. And also, if you look at the small enterprises or the SMEs in ASEAN, only 16% of the SMEs in ASEAN are digitally integrated compared to their large counterparts in, in the region. And I think the COVID-19, in my view, also, in a way, is a, a widening the digital divide. I think it's evident that those who have uh, computers and access to internet uh, and also uh, those who have the skills are able to work or move forward to do their work and, and also to learn more compared to those who don't have access to these resources who are indeed uh, 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 falling behind. I think in my view, again, uh, while ASEAN again is, uh, uh, or digital connectivity or digital adoption in ASEAN is indeed expanding fast over the years, I think there's something missing there in a sense that the level of where it is now is still below up where it should or it could be. And the reason for that is very simple. It's because of the fact that there are still gaps okay, in different areas that support the digital transformation in the region. Here we're talking of gaps related, for, uh, related to affordability, access, quality, also infrastructure, and also gaps related to education or, or skills as well as uh, policies. For example, in terms of policies, uh, e-commerce uh, uh, law is not well established in all ASEAN countries. And also data protection laws are only, uh, I think the most comprehensive ones can be found only in the Philippines, Malaysia, and Singapore. So there is indeed a, a divergence in terms of laws that would support digital transformation. For example, I think there are a number of areas where uh, ASEAN can focus on. I, I think in addition to, uh, building the digital infrastructure needed for this digital transformation. I think for, in my sense, there is a need to uh, strengthen uh, the payment system because the payment system is critical to be able to support the growing e-sector in the region. Secondly, there is a need also to establish the right uh, skills and capabilities needed in order to ensure that people in the region are able to participate in a wider, okay, uh, 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 wider in uh, widely sorry in this uh, digital world. And thirdly, uh, it's obvious that we need to have a more enabling in environment. 
And here I'm referring to the ability of the region to develop the right policies and regulations to make sure that the, the, all countries and the region are able to uh, uh, support a more productive uh, uh, digital uh, uh, sector. I think another area that here that I would like to discuss, and this is related to this new dynamics, is the issue of sustainability. Again, uh, we've been hearing about issues related to climate change, uh, the low carbon transition and so forth. But when I look at these issues, my view is here is that these issues, again, are not new to ASEAN. We've been uh, dealing with these issues for a long time. And similar to digitalization, I think it's about time for ASEAN, in my view, to come up with a more holistic approach in terms of how to address all these sustainability challenges in the region. For example, I think there is a need to come to have a more integrated approach across different community pillars in ASEAN in order to make sure that the sustainability challenges in the region are being addressed more collectively instead of silos. I think the recent initiative in ASEAN, which is the, the ASEAN framework on the circular economy is a good step indeed, in a sense that this is the first framework in ASEAN, particularly on the economic side, that tries to put emphasis on how circular economy can be promoted to promote further sustainability in the region. But in my view, I think the implementation of this framework will be a challenge in a sense that you have to make sure, for example, that there is enough uh, standards and harmonized uh, laws in place to, to, to support all these circular economy products and services. I think another issue here is to what extent trade is open to these uh, recycled products to make sure that non-tariff barriers and any barriers in, in, in general are eliminated to facilitate the trade of all these recycled uh, products in the region. I think there's also the question of investment. I, I think for, uh, for me, uh, if you want to address all the sustainability challenges, you have to make sure that there is enough uh, innovative systems to support the investment in the circular economy. And finally, the question of financing. At the end of the day, uh, addressing all these uh, challenges regarding the climate change and, and, and uh, low carbon uh, carbonization issue would depend so much on how countries are able to uh, come up with the right financing instruments okay, to make sure that uh, we're able to target the right investments to support all these circular economy uh, uh, concerns. And of course, at the regional level, we have to make sure that uh, the region is ready enough you know, to, to come up with more innovative uh, uh, regional financing mechanisms that would help uh, address this, uh, these problems. I think within the regional, within the region, sorry, for example, even to talk about the ASEAN Comprehensive Recovery Framework, we have already indicated there are a number of areas to support sustainability in ASEAN across different dimensions. In here, I would like to only mention two important priorities. I think one is in terms of investment, how the region is able to proceed or facilitate greater investments in terms of clean energy, for example, in terms of supporting uh, climate resilient infrastructure and sustainable infrastructure. I think these are indeed very crucial, particularly at this point in time, we're trying to come up with more uh, stimulus measures. If countries can only focus on uh, investing in all this climate resilient uh, infrastructure, I think we're able to support both, both the post-pandemic recovery as well as the issues of sustainability in the region. Another important area here, as I mentioned earlier, is the financing. I think this is something I hope that, uh, the, re that uh, uh, the, economic, the economic and the finance ministers in, in ASEAN will be able to focus on to come up with a more robust uh, financing mechanism to address all the sustainability concerns. Finally, and I think moving forward, uh, I, I believe that uh, all these new dynamics related to uh, digitalization and sustainability, climate, climate change and so forth, I think should be able to guide the future of regional economic integration. Because in my view, after 2025, or even now, the world is indeed changing. The region is indeed changing a lot. This pandemic has accelerated the need for us to understand better other aspects that might impact on the regional economic integration. Digitalization, sustainability are definitely key issues. Therefore, I would like to see that when we develop the post 
2025 vision for ASEAN, particularly in the ASEAN economic community, that we will be able to come up with a more comprehensive holistic approach, meaning that all these issues related to digitalization and sustainability should be part and parcel of market integration. Because at the moment, those issues are being only referred to. But when you look at the actual initiatives within the AEC, they are not actually well entrenched. Therefore, I think moving forward, uh, when, when we talk about AEC beyond 2025, I'm hoping for a more digitally driven and green market integration for ASEAN. I think I better stop here and uh, I look forward to your questions uh, later on. Thanks, Gwen. Thank you very much uh, for that, Aladdin. You um, nailed some of the key issues. I do think, though, uh, some of the main ones you, you brought up, particularly this issue of the uh, overall trade frameworks um, before Jay and, and others uh, mentioned uh, RCEP uh, and uh, your point about the need for greater harmonization and all that. But also, we have a lot of issues on trade frameworks in the region. I don't think anyone has uh, even uh, mentioned the China's push to join uh, uh, the uh, revamp TPP and uh, the deliberations over that. Um, but also in this rise environment uh, that Dr. Kirida pointed out earlier of, um, you know, growing uh, the strengthening US dollar and very uh, marked increases in debt loads that governments in Southeast Asia have taken on. Um, I think your, your point about the need for more spending on some of these key areas does raise the question about uh, your financing. And as you said, you we need to think about creative ways, but that's definitely a further drain on an already uh, cash-strapped region. So I'd like to turn to my, um, my uh, colleague and friend, Yasu Ota, sitting in Japan. Um, and uh, we'd be very interested, Yasu, also in your perspective from, from the Japanese uh, viewpoint, looking over the region uh, on some of these key issues. So I'm going to throw the ball to you. Hi, thank you, Gwen. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good morning, everybody. You know, it's not my intention to give a clear answer to your question, but ah. you know, I would rather to share with you what I think is a key to ASEAN mm -hmm. to recovery. Mm -hmm. From a Japanese perspective, perspective, since I'm I'm not I'm a journalist, not the uh, economist. I will not speak based on the data or statistics, but rather on hunches and the intuition, if I may, Gwen. You certainly may. <laughs> you always have like an original to, view, yes. So. That's right. Yeah, I like to base my thought on what I have heard from the people I have met, uh, mostly from the the Japan and the US and some from uh, Germany where I have stayed uh, in the past. And uh, I and just learned a lot how ASEAN is viewed uh, from outside. You know, the people of ASEAN are not necessarily so aware of it, but the US, Europe and Japan are shocked and uh, troubled by the economic downturn in ASEAN. Uh, I'm talking about Christmas. You know, the production in the ASEAN region is stagnant and from the end of November now and to the mid-December, there are no products in the US and Japan to sell. You know, as you know, in the US, for example, the 90% of the year in the consumer spending is placed during the Christmas season, which is now, right? So it's not consumer durable, but a rather commodity such as uh, clothing and a small accessories and the toys, which I think, uh, I believe that the, uh, the ASEAN is good at to produce. So a few example I have, what I heard from uh, my sources is Nike, the shoe maker. Uh, the, one of the executives says, we lost 10 weeks of production when the factory in Vietnam, because mm -hmm. the, the factory is closed for well, 10 weeks. That's, that's quite pretty long. And the 990 US companies, including the New Balance, Gap, and the Levi's, sent a letter to uh, President uh, Biden demanding that the, the US should donate vaccine, vaccine to Vietnam because the, the factory in Vietnam is closed, so they are suffering. So the same thing is happening in Europe. Europe and Adidas stopped its factory in Vietnam in July, and uh, Puma 
uh, is also in trouble. And talking about Japan, the supply of parts manufactured in, in Malaysia and Vietnam has been halted. And, and Toyota, for example, has uh, reduced production of, in Japan and in Thailand because they cannot procure parts. And Panasonic has delayed the reporting of its factory for kitchen uh, uh, exhaust runs by the, the moment. And, and in Thailand, the food factories have been closed, as you are familiar with Grant. Uh, mm. Nichirei is a food company, uh, and 7-Eleven, the, the consumer uh, of the companies, are unable to procure fried chicken. So, right. and so they are so, so in problem. I mean, chicken. So we are missing in the fried chicken in Japan. So this is a big thing for them. And Uniqlo also has also has a delay. They have to delay the release of new sweater. So winter is coming here, but the sweater is not available. Uh, so this is uh, the big problem in, 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 in the big market in up north. And as they say, we, we want to sell, but we can't sell. We have nothing to sell. So this is a big problem. ASEAN is more influence on the global economy than many people in ASEAN realized. And, uh, and uh, I think the, uh, the, in other words, there is a disparity, of course, that uh, Gwen said, disparity in the states of the infection crisis at the moment. I believe that this current disparity will make a difference in the economy, economic recovery, uh, in the difference in the speed of recovery and also uh, quantitative of them, a difference. So that's a big thing. But what I am more worried about is the risk that the disparity will rather widen within the ASEAN after the crisis is over. And there is a risk that even after the recovery, there will be a difference in the strength of the economics. Yeah, everybody said that. And the gap among the 10 countries will be larger than before the COVID. And it means that gap in economic potential will widen. It's not just the difference in how effectively we can control the infection or how good our medical care is. It's about uh, industrial supply chain. Um, that's why I, I always say that the uh, area has uh, the great uh, resources uh, in their analysis and uh, researches and papers in uh, supply chains. When I write the stories, an article always I refer to areas paper. So, so I, believe it or not, this is uh, what I recommend to the editors and the journalists in, in the region. Mm -hmm. So whatever you want, uh, numbers or the, the views, uh, go to the, the resource in area. Uh, mm -hmm. The pandemic has more or less changed the inter-regional uh, supply chain in ASEAN because the flow of the people the movement of people has stopped and the movement of the service workers uh, technically and the technicians has stopped. The traffic of parts and uh, components has uh, deteriorated and the supply chain has become uh, fragmented as a result. So uh, for example, I, I heard this story from a friend of mine who works in a Japanese automaker. They, use, uh, they used to concentrate the production of an automobile for the region in, in the plant in Thailand. Mm. Uh, everybody is familiar with that, right? Thai is the center of the auto production for Japanese company, but now they are moving part of the production back to Japan. You know, this is based, basically just because of the becoming more difficult to transfer technology from Japan to Thailand due to the higher wall for coordination between Japan and Thailand. So uh, they have to, they didn't want to, but they have to uh, rewind their production from the ASEAN to Japan. This is a phenomenon that I'm observing. Uh, to put it more bluntly, uh, to the power of the Japanese headquarters quarters to control the Thai and the other nations subsidiary is declining. So for the past years, uh, business travel between the US, between Tokyo and Bangkok has been almost ill, right? So no friend of mine in Thailand, in Tokyo, can travel uh, to both nations. Uh, for electronic companies, what I heard, especially from something called after process, cutting, cutting a semiconductor wafers and to, to produce the chips, this is quite a significant uh, product, I think, uh, when it comes to the US-China confrontation, this is very strategic uh, I think material, so we have to focus on. There is a move to transfer the process from China to Malaysia, which means Malaysia is becoming more attractive 
do the, the supply of the semiconductor. Give us the instructions. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor Mohan. Um, again, I would just. Um, hello? I'm not sure what's going on there. I think <laughs> Let me ask you again. Somebody's voice I can hear. Yeah. Can I continue? Yes, please. Yeah, yeah this is because there are concerns about the geopolitical issue with China. That's one thing. Right. And, uh, they are actually uh, fleeing from, from China to Malaysia, uh, where there is a concentration of electronic industry uh, of Penang, particularly. Uh, this is not directly related to COVID, but it is because of uh, trade uh, friction between China and Japan, uh, China and the US. So we have to think about that. And we need to rethink the way we built our supply chain around China. As a result, the relative importance of ASEAN will change. This is another example of the new normal. I think this is new normal. So uh, initially, many multinational companies, including the Japanese one, thought that the COVID crisis will transitory and uh, try to read it out by enduring rather than restructuring their business. But now they have changed their mindset to configure their production and parts for the procurement under the new normal. So they don't, they cannot just wait and see. So they have to do something because they, it's, it's just because waiting around is not going to solve anything. And they will only make uh, things more expensive. So large companies, uh, larger company actually, uh, are finding it very difficult to manage their supply chains in this region mm -hmm. and fine tune. They cannot fine tune their ordering the procurement and the timely manners. So they have to uh, order in advance. So that makes the big cost. Uh, uh, the big cost of having the inventory and uh, have advanced uh, orders. Uh, this makes the uh, management very really difficult. The risk of, of the cost of inventory and uh, ordering cannot be underestimated, I think. Uh, how to optimize the supply chain, both within ASEAN and other countries connected to ASEAN, will determine the survival of the company, which means uh, survival, survival of ASEAN. Uh, even if uh, over the next year or so, uh, we will have to we will have to start again from the optimized uh, state we are now. We will not go back to our original state. That's my opinion. Uh, we cannot just wait, and we cannot go back to the same position we had before. And a big challenge for ASEAN countries will be how well uh, they will they fit into the new global supply chain. The supply chain, the shape of the supply chain is changing. We cannot expect which will, that will go back to the, uh, the, the original one. So the countries that are most charming, the charming countries to attract the new direct investment will have the advantage. That is not mm -hmm. necessarily the same countries that we have seen in, in the past. The advantage is not only the level of uh, technology or the accumulation of the, the, the technicians and the skill of the workforce as it was before in the past, but I think labor cost and uh, infrastructure and the digitalization and the social start stability, and of course the healthcare system is gonna be very important. So I may be, it may be an extreme case that Oh, should I say that? But the Singapore, which is overly strict, they have very strict, strict con uh, control of the infection, may not be attractive as before for foreign companies. So uh, the winner and the loser might be different from mm -hmm. now on. So foreign investors, including Japanese, are now looking closely at which ASEAN countries will be suitable for investment after the crisis is over. Uh, in other words, uh, this could be an opportunity and, and it's, uh, it's a chance for the latecomer of ASEAN. I mean, so those countries, we, we can name it, right? What I would like to recommend to policymakers in, in the region is to think from scratch, from zero point about the question, what are they selling points? Of, of their country. So this is the question they have to ask for themselves. In short, I, what I wanted to say is that in order to prepare for new dynamics, there's a question Gwen gave us, we need to be self-aware of our competitiveness and to define the new competitiveness and have political uh, policies that appeals to them and the investors. 
And of course, uh, we must not forget that ASEAN is, you know, we have to, we, we must not forget that the ASEAN is not forgotten, right? So, mm -hmm. and in order to increase the attractiveness of ASEAN as whole, ASEAN must come together and say loudly, hey, we are here, right? So everybody's busy in the world. The US, China, Japan is busy with themselves and they're talking about quad, uh, the TPP, whatever, the US, EU relations. But, you know, oh, in, in the middle, middle of this, this situation, we have to raise our hand. This is, I think, of the major missions of uh, the upcoming ASEAN summit. Let me start here, stop here. And I have a bunch of things to, to talk about, about free trade, but uh, we'll get back to you. Gwen, thanks. Yasu, thanks very much. I think you highlighted a lot of, well, what you also highlighted were the contradictions uh, inherent in the region that are getting more and more pronounced and building on what Dr. Kirita told us in the previous uh, uh, um, session, uh, this uh, trend for uh, both at, at the same time, companies leaving China for a variety of reasons, including not just Chinese, but American, Japanese, uh, Korean, etc., into this region. But you also highlighted uh, another trend we haven't really focused on, which is, uh, for example, your example of uh, Japan, some of those companies bringing back some production because they're finding it too difficult to control their subsidiaries in Thailand or whatever in this post pandemic yeah. uh, era. So I think that's a very interesting contradiction, but uh, you also highlighted they, these contradictions across a range of themes. So we might come back to that if we have time. Um, although speaking of which, I think we have to crack on. And so last but very <laughs> not least uh, uh, is uh, Ima from uh, Facebook, who um, has done a lot of research on a lot of things in this region, but I think we'll possibly focus uh, on the digital challenges as well. So over to you, Emma. Thank you so much. And I'm gonna use the same um, uh, caveat as, uh, as Yesu said earlier, I'm not an economist uh, and I'm, I'm really cracking at this um, from the uh, point of view of the private sector. Um, uh, it's 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 a new it's a fairly new uh, uh, reality of, of for me uh, you know 20 years prior to me joining Facebook I was actually in in that seat uh, with with think tanks and and NGOs so um, now speaking from from the perspective of private sector and seeing everything that's been happening in the past two years I think it's it gives me a very interesting perspective as well so I've been hearing um, all the other um, uh, speakers um, you know, the, there's 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 a sense of optimism on some parts. There's a, still a sense of there's a lot that we have to do, and I can't agree more. Um, I think uh, we've seen a lot of things, a lot of challenges in the past 18 months, but definitely um, the opportunities are also there. Um, and what we see um, uh, from the point of view, uh, from my point of view, um, uh, here in the company is 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 absolutely actually more positive, uh, especially for Southeast Asia. Um, Gwen, you, men you mentioned uh, the research that we've done. I'll, I'll be very frank as well. It's research that, the, that, that my team, um, that our teams at Facebook have done here in Southeast Asia um, uh, with Bain and Company. Um, and so this is um, uh, a study that we did, that we do uh, annually. And this year uh, we recently um, uh, put it out. It basically tells us that Southeast Asia continues to lead digital transformation in Asia Pacific. It continues to expand by almost every metric, um, and we've seen the accelerated accelerated growth in 2020. I mean, since the pandemic, I guess, and as well, I think you know, um, there were habits, consumption habits brought about by the pandemic. It has changed uh, significantly. I mean, we saw. Uh, uh, COVID-19 as an acceleration of digital adoption and transformations, not just for consumers, but also businesses across a wide range of sectors. Um, since the start of the pandemic, um, Southeast Asia alone, led by Indonesia, um, added 70 million new online shoppers. Um, and by the end of 2021, we expect each of those countries to have 70 or 70% or more of its adult population as digital consumers. 
So with this growth, we found that this was an opportunity for us, um, the private sector, to provide some leadership to help drive this transformation in partnership with um, the other stakeholders. So we wanted to make sure that, that we, we help in creating that digital pathway for local enterprises and also a platform for communities to create meaningful connections and to support each other. So for the past 18 months, um, since uh, the start of the pandemic, um, you know, I think like everyone else, we, we, we adopted to a normal a, a norm of working from home and, and um, operating uh, very much from where, where, where we're sitting. Um, before the pandemic, I used to be uh, on a plane every two or three weeks to cover the, the markets that I cover. I cover Southeast Asia. Um, so that's Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Singapore, and Thailand. I used to have to travel to each of those countries. And of course, um, since, since um, March of uh, last year, I've been working uh, mainly uh, out of Singapore. But all of these, all of these efforts that we have have not diminished. And in particular, actually, we've I feel we've been more we've been busier than ever. And in, part in particular, we've been almost called on um, to uh, to assist with improving health outcomes, um, to to restore some confidence um, in the economy, and also to ensure that the recovery is sustainable. Um, and so that's what we've been working on for the past eighteen months. So for for improving health, I think one of the things that we have done, um, in particular, in partnership with a lot of governments, is um, using our tools and products to play a critical role in, uh, in allowing governments um, and businesses to communicate with the public on measures being taken to uh, protect the public and resume normal businesses and social activities. Um, I think here in Singapore, um, uh, you see the, um, you know, the government very actively use um, our platforms, in particular WhatsApp, for example, um, using the chatbot um, uh, to announce, uh, to, to, let, uh, the populate, to let the communities know about the numbers, about safety measures, about changes in, uh, in policy uh, for, for overcoming um, uh, uh, social distancing measures and, and all of that. Um, we've also worked with, of course, the WHO, partnered with them um, to launch um, health alerts on WhatsApp, on Facebook. Uh, we have our Facebook COVID-19 Information Center, which is now part of our platform where people can come to find um, relevant and updated information and also where they can find um, accurate information um, to, to curb um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of the information that often um, is spread outside um, of that. Um, that includes tackling misinformation as well, which I can happily go into, but I think uh, not relevant for, for this forum. Um, and COVID-19 has also demonstrated that data is critical component of, uh, for, imp uh, for informed public health response. So we have a program, uh, Data for Good program, that we've provided trusted organizations across Southeast Asia with aggregated and uh, anonymized um, maps on population movement to aid the response efforts. In particular, in Indonesia, where we saw a very big surge, um, where Indonesia um, at some point in, in the past couple of months became the epicenter um, in, in, uh, for, for COVID, and we saw that surge, and, and we continue to see numbers, um, uh, high numbers in, in, in parts of Indonesia, and, and we see the numbers climbing as well uh, in, 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 um, in, different, in different parts of Southeast Asia. So we work with academic partners such as University of Indonesia, CSIS, Mahidol Oxford Tropical Medicine Research Unit in Thailand, mm -hmm. as well as other nonprofit organizations such as UNICEF, um, working directly with, um, with departments of health in the city, state, country level to provide that data um, uh, using the data that we have. Um, and then uh, for, you know, we've been called upon as well, in particular, uh, where we saw um, a lot of small medium enterprises really um, uh, suffer during the pandemic and having to move online. And so realizing this, we have also uh, worked um, uh, with, with a, number of, uh, a, number, a number of different governments, a number of different uh, ministries that, that tackle uh, small medium enterprise. Um, assisting with uh, digital transformation. So the recent study we conducted with the World Bank um, showed that um, you know 15% of SMEs had to close operations, and those who have reopened or survived um, and survived are facing financial pressure and reduced demand. And women-owned businesses are dispropor disproportionately affected by the pandemic. Um, and so we have definitely we have um, tried to our best to to help um, through through different programs that we have um, you know our our signature and flagship 
program, uh, She Means Business, for example, are helping those. Also, there's reason for hope, um, and East Asia and the Pacific um, leads the world in optimism fostered by the use of technology. We found that 61% of SMEs in the region reported a fall in sales due to the pandemic, yet nearly half of business owners in the region said they were optimistic about their future. Uh, and then more than 40% of SMEs in the majority of regions made more than a quarter of their sales through digital channels. So perhaps most importantly in this context, those businesses that made at least 25% of their sales through digital channels were less likely to have seen a reduction in sales compared to the same period last year and less likely to have reduced employees due to the pandemic and more likely to have seen an increase in sales compared to the same period last year. Um, so digital transformation, as we know, can play a critical part in helping businesses remain resilient in the face of the pandemic. And, and so this hopefully answers some of the questions, uh, the question you raised, are we ready for that as well? Um, so we offer a range of initiatives to support small medium enterprise um, from, you know, trainings, virtual trainings, on-demand learning. Um, I mentioned Stephen's business earlier, Boost with Facebook, Blueprint. Um, those are those are some of the resources that we that we make available in most of the ASEAN language and partner with a range of industry, civil society, and public sector partners. Um, and also we have um, welcomed increased collaboration with public sector across industries to ensure that small medium enterprises have access to the training resources they need to start or grow their businesses. And this can be particularly impactful outside of, their, of the tier one cities and could provide opportunities to marginalized communities. Of course, there's also financial inclusion and financial inclusion and, um, and financial literacy as a core to empowering SMEs to start or grow their business. Um, and and through through the programs that I've mentioned before, we launched um, the several financial liter literacy programs, especially targeting women-led businesses. Mm -hmm. So like we said, while we have great improvements and the transformation in ASEAN um, is great in developing the digital economy, um, unfortunately, almost half of the region's population remain unconnected to the internet. And the problem of connectivity, I think, is still very widespread. Um, so this reflects a co connectivity gap between urban centers, rural areas, and difficulty of deploying sustainable digital infrastructure where incomes are low, where people may be unaware of the benefits um, that the internet can bring them or may lack the skills to use um, online services. And also, um, you know, this pandemic has also highlighted that internet is no longer just a convenience, but a necessity. So people with reliable and affordable internet access um, have been able to more easily access and share critical health information, maintain contact with friends and family, work and learn remotely, and otherwise mitigate the adverse impact of social distancing, quarantines, and similar measures. So making the internet available to everyone is also a prerequisite for closing that digital divide. And um, yet, um, you know, people also want to need to must also want to be connected and have necessary digital skills and opportunities to put them to use. Right. And can so you that, say what you see, you know, what what signs do we see that that is increasing in the post pandemic era, the, the efforts to connect more people? Yes, I yeah. So we are um, so we are seeing um, yeah. So for us, we're 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 addressing that um, uh, with several other um, in the private sector, addressing barriers to broadcast broadband connectivity. We're investing in new infrastructure um, so to improve its own network uh, to to improve network facilities, um, ensuring to, uh, uh, including um, partnerships with um, telecom operators to make infrastructure easier and more affordable. So we're trying to make sure that that's being brought into the uh, into the into those that um, that don't have that connectivity. So um, our infrastructure and connectivity investments in ASEAN is expected to deliver economic benefits um, over 70 billion um, US dollars in tw uh, 2020 to 2024. Um, and it's through several potential partnerships um, from Express Wi-Fi to um, uh, Express, uh, Express Wi-Fi platforms in Indonesia and the Philippines and Thailand. And we're exploring additional partners um, with other um, providers in ASEAN. Our infrastructure investments include the, uh, the subsea cables. Uh, we're already an investor in several submarine cables in ASEAN. Um, uh, in addition to three new trans-Pacific cables connecting ASEAN, um, that will go live in the next few years. Um, we have um, edge networks to co-locate co um, caching servers with all major internet service providers, um, and then also providing low bandwidth products with no data charges. 
So um, we, we've launched Discover, a new product that helps people stay connected and more consistently um, by um, enabling them to browse the internet using um, free data. So all of that, I think, uh, you know, that's, that's where we can play a role um, uh, in the private, from the private sector. But I think, um, you know, we're, we're aligned with, um, especially I think um, what has been mentioned by several other speakers, what we need is a supportive policy environment. Right. Uh, we're aligned with the approach to strike a balance between what companies can do to support ASEAN's recovery, but also how governments can put in place a conducive regulatory and policy environment to support investments and partnerships with us. Okay, um, well, thanks, uh, th thanks, Emma. We uh, might need to leave it uh, okay. uh, there, except I do want to get, just get one more question in. Sure. Um, you know, you obviously have so many facts and figures in your head. That was a staggering figure that 50% of, you mean, the ASEAN region is not connected yes. to the internet. That yep. is about 325 million, 350 million people. I, I have to check exactly if 50% yeah. in ASEAN, then where in, you know, because again, right, right. you can't, okay. Singapore so is you, exactly. There's still a lot of yeah. people, and yes, we still a lot hearing, of people, definitely. That's we why we're, yeah. We keep hearing that the region is about the one of the, the most connected in the world. So it is quite staggering. It's that, quite staggering, uh, yeah. We're saying, so actually, could you tell us though, between uh, pre-pandemic, uh, 22 months or 20 months ago and now, how many more users were added, uh, say, pre and, and uh, now? Uh, I've seen a lot of figures, um, but uh, some suggest that Southeast Asia exploded with um, connection. Um, I'll have to come back to you on those exact figures of how many how many were added, added during the pandemic. Um, um, I Signif there was a, a significant number of, of right. users, um, uh, and we have those. We have that data, but um, I think, uh, yeah, how much actually it added, uh, I'm not really sure. Um, and I can come back to you with that data. For okay. Sure. Well, that's obviously the big story. One of the big stories uh, in ASEAN in the for, through the pandemic was this. Yeah. You know, as we've heard before as well. So yeah. thank you very much for bringing us up to date on the digital front. And I'm afraid that you're all. All you speakers were so good and comprehensive that we've uh, used uh, used our time up. Um, so we don't really have any time for discussion because uh, I think the Secretary General is um, is ready to. Yes, sorry, yes, so I can see how disappointed you are. Um, so if I may wind our session up by thanking all of you panelists for really excellent. And I thought you, the three of you, actually fit very well together by covering different parts of the uh, of the whole question. So I think we've come out much better informed than when we um, went in. And uh, thank you very much also for people viewing. And I'd like to hand it back to Lydia. Uh, it's there, Lydia. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gwen, and to, to all of the panelists. That was really excellent and, and very interesting. And I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions. It's now my great honor to introduce our final session, the special dialogue with the Secretary General of ASEAN, Dato Limjo Khoi, with Professor Nishimura. Professor Nishimura, the floor is yours. Hello, Dato. Hello, Thank you Nishimura very much. It's a very busy time. Thank you very much for us to giving you a very special time. Yeah. We had a very good discussion, session one, session two. Session one, impact of the COVID-19. Session two, new reality. And the, considering the very, very the good discussion, I'd like to ask you two sets of questions. One is the, a kind of the question uh, pertaining to the economic the, uh, matters. I, I am the, uh, thinking the very three sets of the question. This is based on our, our session one, session two. First, maybe it's very uh, uh, time limited. So you can please answer all these three elements of the, the major economic the questions. One element. 
what are the major challenges for ASEAN to recover quickly from the damage caused by pandemic? We discussion, we have a discussion, session one, session two. And element two, what are the next steps pertaining to the, this is not to the detailed discussion, but the core of the ASEAN integration, ASEAN single window in the context of the very important today's issue, digital ASEAN. And the third element, what other next steps for ASEAN regarding the implementation, implementation of the RCEP. These three important elements are the, uh, I, 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 I think the uh, listening to the session one and the session two. Please first answer, uh, in this, these two, three important elements. And the, on top of that, if we want to deliver that this is very important to, uh, a point which Secretary General want to deliver our colleagues, our, our round table peoples. Okay, for your side, uh, Please respond to to one set of economic matters. Yeah. Thank you, Shimura-san. Welcome to Jakarta. Uh, okay. Um, your question is: What are the major challenges uh, for ASEAN to recover quickly from the damages caused by the pandemic? I think it's untold story that the uh, Pandemic has uh, caused a lot of uh, distress and also and has economic downturn to many of our member states. But uh, what is more important is now, as we begin to recover, I'm particularly concerned about the uneven vaccinations rates among our member states. You know, some of the member states has reached 80%. For example, Singapore, Malaysia, even Cambodia is now reaching to that stage. So there are effort to increase the rollout of vaccination. And we are very confident by the end of the year, ASEAN will reach at that target. Obviously, currently it's about 30% of total population receive at least one dose of the COVID-19, but the rollout even in Indonesia has been very much uh, impressive. I think we are very confident that will be. The figure is encouraging, remain uh, inadequate in certain area, but we are very upbeat about there's, there's a need for us to speed up the vac vaccination rollout, particularly in country where the rates are still relatively uh, very low. COVID-19 uh, response fund and the establishment of the ASEAN Center of Public Health Emergency and Emerging Diseases are some of the regional activities that we have uh, hope enable us to expedite the uh, vaccination process. Uh, this will also strengthen our capability and to prevent, detect, response to public health emergency. And the utilization of the uh, uh, technology uh, really helps us to further improve our uh, measures toward uh, this uh, COVID-19. And it really helps us to boost the rollout of vaccination and also other aspect of uh, uh, measure we have done in ASEAN member state. Uh, we also need to be mindful the uneven recovery that is currently taking place across and within sectors of the economy and segments of society. Uh, this issue, if left unaddressed, which you have all discussed about it, may result 
in growing inequality, not only inequality in terms of income, but inequality in terms of access to digital technology, access to uh, what we uh, 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 see the next wave of our economic growth and is a driver for economic growth in ASEAN. So we need to make sure that uh, this uh, technology, uh, which is part of the uh, as, uh, recovery framework that we uh, put in place, and we make sure that they are accessible to everyone or the society in ASEAN. At the same time, I think the broad impact may pose risk to our peace, stability in the region, which we have enjoyed for the last many, many decades. I think this is very important. It has some, some uh, peace and stability in, in, uh, implication. The focus of our intervention should now be on the sector and segment of society that are most uh, vulnerable by the pandemic, uh, especially the MSMEs, women and youth, and also the vulnerable group of the uh, uh, that associated with tourism. I think these are very, very important area that we should try to, uh, rec um, to uplift them, recover them as soon as possible. And uh, finally, it is important for us to speed up the recovery process in the area of travels and tourism industries, uh, which contribute of 12.1% of GDP, an equivalent of more than $380 billion. I think huge amount of the uh, activities in each country. For example, in Indonesia, a lot of MSME are very much dependent on uh, tourism. Uh, in Thailand, uh, very much dependent on the activity of tourism. That's why you see the first opening up of the activities at tourism area. For example, in, in uh, Phuket, Langkawi, and now uh, tourism will be open in Bali uh, and this one, I think. Uh, some country have introduced measure to gradually ease mobility restriction, such as domestic travel, bubbles, sandbox programs. Regionally, uh, we have finalized uh, the, the post uh, COVID recovery plan for ASEAN tourism. We have expedited the implementation of ASEAN Travel Corridor Arrangement Framework, which was endorsed by our minister in, in August. Uh, this essentially facilitate business travels without, as well as other activity of essentials. Uh, eventually we'll go to tourism uh, travels, but without compromising public health and security uh, this is particularly challenging as there are various protocols and put in place by ASEAN member states, such as uh, mandatory quarantine, testing requirement, vaccine, uh, uh, mutual recognition. These are areas where ASEAN travel corridors are now engaging so that we will be able to use this travel corridor next wave our uh, uh, opening. And hopefully the leader will endorse this in this month and work has to be carried out in subsequently in the months to come. And tourism minister will be meeting in January in Sihanoukville, I think. And our, our health minister will be meeting in November in, in Indonesia. I don't know whether it's Bali or Jakarta or yet to be. In, I think these are the two events that we're looking how this as a travel corridor can be further implemented and refined based on either bilateral or trilateral or quadrilateral depending, but the framework is a, is a provide a platform for a further work to be done. On the next steps pertaining to ASEAN a single window, I think context of digital ASEAN, ASEAN single window uh, already operationalized in all ASEAN member states. Uh, 
uh, very, I think the only region in the world that have uh, this sort of uh, uh, arrangement and five M uh, as a member states, uh, Cambodia, Malaysia, Myanmar, Singapore, and Thailand are able to exchange uh, ASEAN custom declaration document through this platform, remaining uh, ASEAN member state to join live operation and uh, this within this year, I think 2021. Indonesia and Thailand have also confirmed their readiness to conduct end-to-end -end electronic phytosanitary certificate December 2021, which is expected to be live operation by 2022. With three document exchanges on 2022, ASEAN will be in a position as one of the most advanced region transforming itself to paperless trading. We hope we will be uh, trading without any papers, any document, or have to go through digital. This would add more confidence, I think, to the region as we achieve at trying to double our intra-ASEAN trade by 2025. Doubling means not in terms of percentage, doubling means in terms of the volume, because uh, percentage will be a little bit difficult to double it. ASEAN is also working uh, on the detail expanding ASEAN single window to dialogue partners in all the ASEAN plus one FTA, including China, Japan, Korea, United States, uh, Australia, New Zealand. Uh, this will allow us to exchange with other trade related document, each certificate origin, and we hope this will further enhance utilization of our plus one FTA and and also the other FTA that we are working with. Uh, additionally, I think uh, the next steps uh, for our recovery uh, very much uh, basic on what we need to make sure that RCEP is the ASEAN-led agreements. I think we have to dispel this a lot of media was saying it's a China-led. I don't think it's China-led, it's ASEAN-led all the way. The chair is ASEAN, Iman Bombagio bon from Indonesia. I think we have to dispel it. Our editor should understand that this is ASEAN plus led mechanism, not others mechanism. So firstly, we have a signed this agreement last year in a big bang. We must make sure that we must implement it. The rectification threshold can be achieved this year uh, 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 and enter into force 60 days after January when we, uh, we are targeted. And by the look of it, ASEAN will achieve its target. So it's ASEAN plus country will also target. This threshold requires ratification by six ASEAN and none ASEAN three signatory. We are working closely with ASEAN member states and none ASEAN country, uh, non -ASEAN -ASEAN country to expedite the respective domestic uh, procedure. You know, China is already in door to rectify it. Japan is on board and hopefully uh, New Zealand. So. The non ASEAN is already uh, qualified the quota, and six ASEAN, Singapore, recently uh, Laos, I'm hoping Brunei, uh, Cambodia, Thailand has already passed through parliament, looking into Malaysia. So we are very hopeful that it can be implemented. This is going to be the largest FTA with 30% of the population and 30% of the GDP and a lot of it very much, uh, uh, very much uh, a bit about the future prospect of this region. Secondly, works on entering into force of agreement uh, is currently um, this work preparation institutional organizations instrument, such as work program, rule of procedure for the future RCEP joint committee. Uh, the work program on economic and technical cooperation also being role be discussed, as well as uh, the establishment of RCEP secretariat. Uh, this is to ensure 
once agreement into, into force, we will be in a position to implement in a good way. Thirdly, we are also conducting outreach web banner to the business community to inform them on the technical requirement of the RCEP agreements. Uh, this agreement brings benefits uh, to business and, and on, not only for them to understand the provision of the uh, requirements stipulated in the agreements, and, uh, but the secretary will, will work closely with East Asia Business Council and we will organize uh, so far two web banner on trade related uh, chapters and we'll continue uh, with other topics such as trade and services, investment, e-commerce in other chapter. Uh, we will really welcome this collaboration with the uh, business people, uh, other organizations to expand uh, our outreach to other business. I'm sure similarly other uh, non-ASEAN RCEP countries also doing this similar uh, outreach to the business people and community. I think we need only not only the business community, but also the public to understand what's all about uh, the public. I think uh, works underway uh, to look into area where we can outreach to everyone of us in, in, in ASEAN in particular. Uh, the next steps also what we're doing is the, um, we, we are uh, working closely to start our secretariat, uh, um, RCEP uh, secretariat, uh, which will be the main engine for the implementation of the RCEP. So those are a few things that we are working Nishimura san. Hopefully, this will uh, uh, clear the air of what's going on in this region. Nishimura san, I'm sorry, we cannot hear you. I think, thank you very much. That uh, ASEAN should be proud of ASEAN way. When after was proposed, nobody believed it, but ASEAN did it. The same when ASEAN single window was proposed, nobody believed it, but did it. And RCEP. That was 10 years ago, next year, Chair Cambodia, 2012. ASEAN proposed, yes, area did a very important role to make a concept of RCEP. That's definitely RCEP is a ASEAN proposal. And this was, did it. ASEAN way, the consensus way is only way to overcome the most difficult question. And ASEAN did it. And DATO was involved for this ASEAN way for a few decades. When the after was proposed, DATO was directly involved in this, this achievement. RCEP, single window, DATO's Excellent what kind of result of the for decades of achievement. Thank you very much. Area would like to area has a responsibility to the implementation or to promote the RCEP because the fundamental research result was done by area in 2012. You can see the mid-term review of the AC20. One five. Clearly, the RCEP was mentioned in the formal formal document. Next, that was thank you very much. Next is a, a relatively political or geopolitical the uh, interest of the journalists. The three three elements, please bear in mind. The end to answer. Uh, these kind of the interest. This is also related with our the, uh, sessions. First element, 
when can ASEAN outlook on Indo-Pacific be operationalized? And at the context of the, 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 the broader geopolitical situation. And element two, what role can ASEAN play to maintain stability in the region during the US-China competition? And maybe this is a very sensitive, difficult question. So uh, what are the next steps to bring the agreed five-point consensus on Myanmar to fruition? Maybe not necessary to respond to, to, to uh, the individually, but please, considering these three elements, I, we would like to listen to your Dato's the, 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 uh, opinion. Thank you, please. Uh, AOIP is not new. I think it has been in the ASEAN uh, program for quite some time, only that we have endorsed the concept of AOIP in 2020. And uh, since adoption, the AOIP has uh, served as one of the key reference for external partner in promoting real cooperation in ASEAN. Uh, we welcoming, in welcoming the development of increased number of partners, likewise manifested the uh, support for AOIP. Uh, our focus in OIP is very much uh, the same as other people, rule-based, all those uh, principles, but the key uh, element in our AOIP is cooperation. Cooperation brings a lot of benefit and cooperation brings a lot of peace, stability in the region. We want peace and stability so that we can develop our region, our regional prosperity. And in order to that, uh, we uh, increased our in, uh, reinforce our utility of the AOIP as a framework for cooperation between ASEAN and its partners. I, I, I think that ASEAN can pursue a discussion on how to mainstreaming uh, and operationalize most of these key priority area where there's a lot of convergence in all AOIP concept, whether it's in Japan concept or US concept or EU concept and other people's concept in the area of maritime cooperation. I think uh, even India, uh, maritime cooperation is an area that everybody can work closely to make sure we maintain this region, a region of peace, a region of stability, as well as uh, cooperation in making sure that we, 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 we really work closely in the area maritime. And another one is connectivity. Connectivity is key to the development of the region you know, peace and security. We have master plan of ASEAN connectivity. We have a belt and road. We have other connectivity. I think we can see where there's synergy, where is a convergence, we can work closely in order to enhance connectivity so that this will further uh, uh, increase prosperity in the region and certain connectivity need to be able to work closely. The other elements within our AOIP is you, uh, uh, sustainable development uh, and we, we can work closely with the UN on some of the sustainable development agenda, as well as our agenda in the uh, ASEAN Blueprint 2025. And there are so many other economic activities in the area of uh, Indo-Pacific. I think we can uh, work out, see how we can best ad agree among ourselves and, and develop those uh, area of cooperation. And this can be done to various other ASEAN-led mechanism including ASEAN plus one. We will be working with 
ASEAN plus one country. We can work within EAS. We can do with the uh, uh, ASEAN plus three and other uh, region. So that's AOIP work is in progress uh, to implement AOIP. And hopefully uh, because of the pandemic, there are so many activity was uh, uh, postponed or canceled. And I hope that when the pandemic uh, recede, there will be a lot of activity in the area of cooperation in uh, AOIP. And for that, uh, we want to see this region maintain peace and stability. And for that, we see the uh, US and China dialogue uh, a major uh, trading partner of ASEAN. Uh, China is number one trading partner and increasingly in number increasingly important investment for uh, uh, FDI for ASEAN. The same as US is a number one uh, investment to ASEAN and also number two major trading partner. And we will see that they have contributed substantively to the economic development and economic growth of the region, thus, uh, in a way, uh, helping us to, uh, uh, to increase our community building. I think we want to see uh, some stability in the relationship between ASEAN and China, and these are all August well for every one of us, including them. So we see the ASEAN primary contribution uh, to the region peace stability are uh, twofold. One is building community among its members and to ensure that we have a peace and stability in the region. Uh, hence, uh, one or less area in the region could be a source of uh, instability. We don't want, want to see that. We want to see a peaceful, good relation between the two big giant and we the, the, the competition will be very healthy, but at the same time, we want to make sure they are uh, within the uh, context of uh, prosperity in the region. On the other hand, ASEAN also provide platform for dialogue and cooperation for regional uh, countries, including uh, US and China. While both the US and China have their own bilateral channels of dialogue, the presence and participation in ASEAN-led mechanism, such as East Asia Summit, ASEAN Regional Forum, ASEAN Defense Minister Meeting Plus, provide them another platform for interaction, uh, which they could convey amidst their peers as well as their respective position on issue. Uh, this mechanism is provide them with the opportunity to pursue, I think, cooperative undertakings and to develop a confident measure and foster better understanding among their respective officials and people. I think, admittedly, uh, the challenge for ASEAN is just for other stakeholders in the region, how to ensure uh, there is interest, their interests and uh, are not disregarded as a major power uh, uh, to pursue this. The need for ASEAN to be relevant as, as possible, as all more needed at this time. I think the bright side is that both US and China continues to pronounce the support for ASEAN centrality, as well as ASEAN being in the driving force in the regional affairs in this region. We hope such manifestation of support would be pursued substantively and uh, enhanced in the future. And in the area of uh, Myanmar issue, I think uh, this is uh, an issue where our friends in the media are very much uh, interested. Uh, I know the five point consensus call for one immediate cessation of violence in Myanmar, dialogue among key stakeholders, especially in Boy of ASEAN Chair and provision of humanitarian assistance to AHA Center and special in Boy delegation to visit Myanmar. 
uh, we have a special envoy being uh, 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 agreed by uh, by ASEAN. Special envoy is very much uh, seized with the work on helping to bridge the gap that uh, that's uh, happening in Myanmar, and hopefully that special envoy will be able to uh, to go there and have uh, uh, some uh, discussion. And this all depends on how we uh, uh, see the, the position of uh, the situation there. We want to see Myanmar to be stable because they are part of ASEAN and unstable Vietnam, Myanmar has an implication to ASEAN. So the special envoy is very much seized with all these elements. But on my part, I think uh, I'm uh, head of humanitarian assistance in ASEAN, I have done my part by uh, the consensus for is to provide humanitarian assistance to Myanmar through AHA Center. Uh, we have a pledging conference to support the Myanmar humanitarian assistance uh, convened on the 18th of August 2021. Uh, we uh, managed to raise uh, amount more than 8 million US dollar in monetary and in kinds contribution uh, of pledges by uh, either medical supply, equipment or vaccine. We continue uh, further to receive pledges in contribution around 2 million after the pledging uh, conference. So we are very grateful that our dialogue partner and ASEAN friends, uh, member state uh, very much come up with this uh, Pledging, and we we hope more pledging, pledging will be uh, 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 given to us by our friends in the future. Uh, the first batch of the humanitarian assistance to Myanmar, uh, comprising of one million, one point one million worth of medical supply and equipment, was handed to Myanmar Red Cross on the fifteenth September and item deliver in the batch will be distributed to our uh, to hospitals in various other parts of Myanmar to Red Cross. Preparation is also underway for the second batch of humanitarian assistance later this month and the third batch in November. Um, in order to effectively carry out uh, this plan, ASEAN cannot work alone. I don't, ASEAN must work constructively and in a practical manner with our partners, of course, with friends and among ASEAN member states. It is important that we should not politicize ASEAN humanitarian assistance in Myanmar to ensure that support reaches to the effective community in needs in expedited, in expedited manners uh, without impediment. I think we we have to work closely. This is humanitarian assistance. Humanitarian assistance means to everyone and every friends in Myanmar, irrespective of political affiliation. I think this is very important. I think in conclusion, I think a peaceful resolution to the current situation rests on the people of Myanmar. I think the Myanmar people has to resolve themselves. Of course, we can help them. And uh, it won't be reached overnight. It will take uh, sometime ASEAN stands ready to assist Myanmar on the path to such solution through uh, facilitating facilitating reconciliation in constructive dialogues among all parties I think provided we will continue to provide humanitarian assistance I think during this process uh, ASEAN could become a bridge to bring helping hands uh, together for the benefit of the Myanmar people. I think this is uh, a very important aspect because uh, Myanmar has uh, suffered from the uh, third wave of uh, COVID-19 uh, and, and we need to help them. And this assistance is uh, very important in terms of medical supply and medicine as well as vaccine. Uh, so uh, this will help them to, to mitigate those uh, uh, COVID-19. So it is the people in Myanmar that we are concerned to help them. As a head of humanitarian assistance, we will, will work uh, more diligently 
double the work to get more assistance from friends and dialog partner. Uh, that's what we're doing in the uh, secretariat. Thank you very much. Yeah. They're remembering the establishment of ASEAN 1967. Situation is more than the terrible comparing with these days. The existence of ASEAN is really symbolizing the peace and the stability. So the world should be the existence of ASEAN and how to strengthen ASEAN. The, the meaning of ASEAN centrality as a meaning of the peace and the stability in the world now. So the ASEAN integration, ASEAN community building is a very important the answer to the world on stability, I believe. Area is the surely a part of us and the, we'd like to the very honored to support the ASEAN secretary, the, the, the very great the works. Anyway, thank you very much. They're uh, 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 very comprehensive response from Secretary General. So I'd like to back to the floor to, to read here. Okay, thank you. Gentlemen, thank you so much for, for an excellent discussion. And Dato Lim Jokhoi, we are honored and so very deeply appreciative of you taking the time out of your extremely busy schedule to share your deep and rich knowledge and insights with us today. So thank you from all of us. It's now my pleasure to introduce Mr. Koji Hachiyama, the Chief Operating Officer of Iria, to give closing remarks. Hachiyama-san, over to you. And thank you, Lydia. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, today, uh, thank you very much for your active participation for <clears throat> Iria's 10th Annual Editors Roundtable. Today, we had a very rich discussion. So I think everybody for <clears throat> feel that discussion time is too short. For today's discussion, we learned a lot how to overcome the COVID-19, exploring the new dynamics for post-pandemic with digitalization, green growth, circular economy, new mechanism, and so on. And current situation could be a big chance for the new business. Area's role is to provide policy recommendation based on our research and as statement of summit and minister uh, meeting mentioned, our research is influenced to the policy for COVID-19 in this region. However, this is not enough for policymakers to make and implement the, uh, their policy. All of you, editors and journalists are working on the front line of information sharing. Therefore, I'd like to emphasize that all of you, your role is crucial. You are the best informers of our common efforts to fight back against the pandemic. I believe that our collaboration will have the most effective impact on the region. Keep up the good work, stay healthy, and I hope to see all of you in person in Cambodia next year. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Hachiyama-san. This brings us to the end of the event. I would like to thank all of our excellent panelists and moderators for participating and make the, making this such a successful event. And of course, thank you to all of our participants. Your attendance and, and questions are greatly appreciated. For any of you ha who have questions about particular issues, please feel free to reach out to us. We will do our best to uh, provide you with information or um, line up interviews with area experts. So just send us an email and we can uh, work on setting something up. With that, I bid you all farewell and this event is now closed. <laughs>